Recording in progress. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Wednesday, May 10th, 2023 afternoon session of the Portland City Council. Good afternoon, Keelan. Please call the roll. Good afternoon. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. Now we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor. Thank you. Welcome to the Portland City Council. To testify before council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance on the council agenda at www.portland gov slash council slash agenda. Information on engaging with city council can be found on the council clerk's webpage. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be, be allowed. If you cause a disruption, a warning will be given. Further disruption will result in ejection from the meeting. Anyone who fails to leave once ejected is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Your testimony today should address the matter being considered. When testifying, state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. Thank you. Thank you very much. First item is a report, item 372. City Council to convene as Prosper Portland Budget Committee to receive the Prosper Portland FY 2023-24 budget or proposed budget and hold a public hearing. Thank you. I'm now convening the Prosper Portland Budget Committee for the purpose of approving the fiscal year 2023-24 budget. The Prosper Portland budget was provided to the public and members of the Budget Committee on Friday, May 5th. I now request that Keelan call the roll of the Budget Committee. Ryan. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Wheeler. Here. Good afternoon, everyone. Momentarily, we're going to hear from Pos Prosper Portland Board Chair Gustavo Cruz, who will introduce the Prosper Portland budget, and of course, the staff who will present with him on the budget. Prior to reviewing the 2023-24 budget the year ahead, I'd like to note that this hearing comes just a few weeks after the City Council adopted the Advance Portland Plan as the roadmap for economic growth and inclusive recovery. And we had the opportunity to hear a little bit more about that this morning. 
I commend and thank Chair Cruz and the board, Executive Director Branham, and indeed the entire Prosper Portland team for your outstanding leadership alongside so many public and private partners to establish a data and community informed plan. And I'd like to thank Commissioner Rubio as well as the commissioner in charge for her outstanding leadership. Prosper spearheaded these efforts while, while simultaneously continuing to perform the essential small business support, real estate development and economic development work on behalf of the city. As we turn our attention to the 2023-24 budget, it's clear that we must ensure the budget enables Prosper Portland to execute an array of critical initiatives and projects that support the city's goals for economic growth and to begin to implement Advance Portland. Chair Cruz, I'll now turn this over to you and Prosper uh, for the leadership team. But before I do that, I want to see if Commissioner Rubio had any comments you'd like to make at this point. Very good. Uh, Chair Cruz, welcome. Thanks for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Gustavo Cruz, Chair of the Prosper Portland Board of Commissioners. I'm joined by our Executive Director, Kimberly Branham, Economic Development Director, Shay flaherty Bettin, Development and Invest Investment Director, Lisa Abouaf, and our Finance Manager, Tony Barnes. We're pleased to be here this afternoon to present the fiscal year 2023 to 2024 proposed budget to City Council serving as Prosper Portland's Budget Committee. I will kick us off and then Kimberly will provide an overview of the budget, key outcomes, and our strategic priorities. Shay and Lisa will then share how those priorities are reflected in the programs and projects they will lead with their teams in the year ahead. You will also hear some initial findings from the analysis Eco Northwest performed in alignment with the budget note City Council passed last year. The budget note directed the City Budget Office to incorporate $8 million in ongoing resources each to Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau and instructed the agencies to secure a third party evaluation of TIF districts that have already or will soon expire. Next slide, please. For, for the city's economic and urban development agency, Advance Portland, a call to action for inclusive economic growth, serves as the key strategic framework guiding Port Prosper Portland's priorities and budget for the coming year. The budgeted resources and investments also align with the mayor's proposed budget and the updated 10-year financial sustainability plan, which established a blueprint to guide the agency's financial and business practices in the context of declining tax increment financing revenues and the need for more flexible resources to support inclusive economic prosperity. Accordingly, the proposed investments deploy a diversity of funds and, and a social impact model to help Portland small businesses, traded sector industries, and the central city and neighborhood commercial districts to stabilize and grow through community-driven, equity-centered programs like the Inclusive Business Resource Network, Mercatus, My People's Market, Portland Means Progress, the TIF District Action Plans, Small Business Grants and Loans, and the Neighborhood Prosperity Network. And recognizing the critical need to strengthen diverse small businesses, the budget also includes resources for operating and capital funding for immediate window repair, relief from increased insurance costs, longer term business growth and expansion, helping industry partners to deploy innovative green products and services, and igniting commercial district marketing and activations to drive foot traffic back into downtown and along business corridors. Next slide, please. On behalf of the board, I offer our thanks to the members of the Community Budget Committee listed on the slide, as well as the many community, community partners and staff involved in the preparation of this budget. We appreciate the considerable time invested in refining and pr prioritizing investments in alignment with both citywide and geographically specific <coughs> priorities, as well as a racial equity lens. We, we also very much appreciate the investments included in Mayor Wheeler's proposed budget that will help small businesses impacted by the lingering effects of COVID to operate and stay open and to support key community, excuse me, key community events with significant economic impact in our city. Thank you for this vote of confidence in Prosper Portland's work to advance an inclusive recovery and economic growth in Portland. And now I'll hand the presentation over to Executive Director Kimberly Brown. Thank you, Chair Cruz. 
Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. For the record, I'm Kimberly Branham. I use uh, pronouns like she and her, um, and I am executive director of Prosper Portland, and I just want to take an, one minute to recognize the chair um, for his service. Um, we have a fabulous board, and um, the chair sits at the helm of it. It's a lot of work, and it is a completely volunteer position, so I want to recognize and appreciate um, the chair for his leadership. All right, we are going to um, now go into some of the outcomes that we have for the most recent fiscal year in which we have complete data. So looking back at 21-22, um, which as we all know was still at the height of the pandemic, so some of these resources or some of these numbers reflect that. Um, we still see that uh, through the programs that the chair mentioned, more than 1,300 jobs were created, retained, or placed through economic development activities like the Enterprise Zone program that you heard about this morning. Uh, nearly 1,200 adults and youth received services through workforce development programs, 60% of whom identified as people of color. More than 20, I'm sorry, more than 2,200 businesses have been served through the Inclusive Business Resource Network over the last programmatic cycle, of which 68% identify as black, indigenous, or a person of color. And in fiscal year 21-22, our resources were leveraged uh, more than eight to one, so uh, one being our resources with eight and a half per, uh, to, to eight and a half times um, private and other public resources. And of the resources that were invested in physical improvements, 56% of construction projects investments were contracted through certified firms. I wanna repeat that because I'm proud of that number. 56% went to COVID certified firms of which 53% were to DBE or um, MBE or WBE certified firms. The local small business repair program distributed uh, 221 businesses, I'm sorry, grants to businesses needing immediate repairs and supported diverse local businesses through events like My People's Market and Portland Means Progress. Next slide, please. So with the goal of furthering inclusive growth through best practice interventions, as you know, Advanced Portland is grounded in the values of racial equity and inclusion, climate action, intentional growth, and effective partnerships, and seeks progress on four objectives that are shown on this slide. That's, the first is propelling inclusive economic growth and innovation. The second is promoting equitable wealth creation. The third is fostering vibrant commercial centers and neighborhood commercial districts. And the fourth is connecting Portlanders to high quality jobs in future ready sectors. You're gonna hear a lot more about the way in which our budget and our work plans advance um, and align with each of these objectives from Sarah, I'm sorry, from, <laughs> sorry, I just combined Lisa and Shay, from Shay and Lisa, excuse me. All right, next slide, please. All right, at a high level of the $350 million in available resources that we have this year, which is net of the housing set aside, um, we anticipate up to $176 million in total expenditures. 44% of resources come from existing cash balances in TIF districts and new TIF that will be issued in the coming year. Another 45% comes from earned revenue and revolving loans, with 11% coming from the combination of federal grants, general funds, and cannabis tax resources. To support this work, our budget includes a total of 95 um, FTE and LTE with the staff levels for our three external facing departments noted on the slide. This includes one net additional position more than we have budgeted um, in this current fiscal year um, due to three positions that will be supporting Reimagine Oregon and seed programs that are coming over from Civic Life and two fewer, two fewer ARPA um, supported limited term positions. Next slide, please. So as we look to the five-year forecast and we compare that to the financial sustainability plan that we've had an opportunity to talk to you about, um, we see that we, we anticipate approximately $200 million in new resources using the forecast allocation of um, additional general fund per the budget note um, on returning TIF that Chair Cruz mentioned, as well as what we anticipate in terms of um, TIF proceeds. Compared to that 10-year uh, forecast, or I'm sorry, compared to the 10-year financial sustainability plan, the overall gap between our budgeted resources, and this is fairly conservative, we don't include things like anticipated sale because until it happens, we can't, you know, we don't want to show those resources in the budget. Um, but so from a, a fairly 
um, conservative perspective, we anticipate that there's a roughly $18 million gap between our financial sustainability plan and our currently budgeted resources. The work to close this gap is primarily to create additional earned income from loans and investments um, that align with advanced Portland objectives and are deployed using our uh, newly formed strategic investment fund as well as remaining TIF district resources. And Lisa's gonna talk a little bit more about that. We're really optimistic that we can close this gap and maintain level of service, but wanna be transparent that if we are not successful in making those investments, then the gap will grow um, exponentially over time because um, as, as you can imagine, it's important for us to make the investments so that we can have returns that accumulate. All right, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Shay to talk about our non-TIF supported programs. Thank you, Director Branham. Good afternoon, Mayor, good City afternoon. Commissioners. For the record, my name is Shay flirty Bethin. I use pronouns like he, him, and el, and I serve as the Economic Development Director at Prosper Portland. So the bulk of today's presentation is, of course, around the city's many TIF districts, but I'm going to take this moment to remind you and go over some of the non-TIF portions of Prosper Portland's work, including the work of our Economic Development Department. You'll recall we covered this work in greater detail at the March 23rd Budget Council presentation on Community and Economic Development, where you heard from Director Branham and our ECED manager, Robert Smith. So hopefully this section is more of a refresher. Go to the next slide. First, I wanna to speak to our existing business lines with ongoing funding, as well as how they align with our new Advanced Portland strategy. Within the first objective, where we include the work of our business advancement team, you heard about the Enterprise Zone just this morning, but I'll know that this work also entails uh, the work where we serve as liaisons to our city's industry cluster, our work of Portland Means Progress, collaborations with the Port of Portland and the Office of Government Relations around international trade and relations, and support for our film industry. Within the goal of fostering vibrant commercial districts, our ongoing investments here look like the city's partnerships with Venture Portland and the Neighborhood Prosperity Network districts. And within goal two of equitable wealth creation, I'd like to highlight the work of our Inclusive Business Resource Network, our Mercatus Registry, My People's Market, and now the new allocations for Reimagine Oregon and the seed grants. Lastly, I'll call out that our ongoing partnership with Work Systems Inc. around youth and adult workforce development is also funded on an ongoing basis. If we go to the next slide. So now looking at one-time fund allocations, this slide shows a few of the highlights that I'd like to mention. There are several new one-time allocations as well as proposed carryover for multi-year programs that have been funded by American Rescue Plan Act dollars. We've been very excited that some of these one-time investments are resulting in more perennial infrastructure moving forward, such as that of the small business hub. We're also carrying over expanding rapid workforce training given that parts of our economy have still yet to fully recover. And I'd like to especially call out the upcoming Small Business Stabilization Grants, which we are now calling Restore to complement our successful repair grant. Um, we're looking, we're proposing to carry over 1.4 million in ARPA dollars, and we're also including the additional 500,000 that the mayor's proposed budget adds to that fund. You'll also recall the new Office of Events and Filmed received two years of one-time funding. We are looking to carry over funds for the second year of that work, and our proposed budget also includes the mayor's team's proposed $400,000 of new funds to support some of the larger events in our downtown and central city. I wanna thank Burke Nelson and Amanda Park for their leadership there, as well as your council offices for attending a recent kickoff of 115 events that the office is funding across the city this summer, primarily to activate our neighborhoods in central city. Lastly, I wanna call out new funding and carryover that is allowing us to pursue explorations of new TIF districts, both in East Portland and the central city. If we look at the next slide. Lastly, here you're able to see how much is allocated into each program and where each of the respective funds are coming from, whether that's cannabis, ARPA, general fund, E-Zone, or federal sources like community development block grants. Our department usually works with roughly $11 million of ongoing economic workforce development resources that are not restricted to traditional tax increment finance districts, and those are represented by the blue and the gray that you see on screen. You'll also see just how hard the team has been at work to incorporate the one-time resources represented by the green and the yellow. The new allocations for Reimagine Oregon and seed grants are particularly difficult new lifts, and I wanna recognize both our own Shabri Vickers and Akil Patterson, who is coming over to Prosper from the Office of Civic Life to join Robert Smith's entrepreneurship and community economic development team. 
think with that, I'm handing it back to Executive Director Branham for an overview of our TIF districts. Thank you, Shay. All right. So um, with this next section, I'm going to address um, some of the questions that we've heard from Council um, that originally came from the budget note, but I think have been um, brought forth just by the fact that we are at the end of the life of a number of tax increment finance districts. And so there are a number of questions that come up in terms of what was, you know, what was the net impact of those TIF districts and what have we learned in the process. Um, as directed by the budget note, we, um, along with Portland Housing Bureau, engaged with Eco Northwest to do some of this analysis. And so I'm gonna have a chance to talk about that with you. I wanna be very clear um, that Eco Northwest is a subject matter expert and they have gifted us with these slides, um, but we are going to have an opportunity um, to have them speak directly with you. And so if there are questions that we can't answer at this time, we'll be able to come back with more detail when they have the full report. This is sort of a sneak peek of, of the first phase. All right, but just um, for the viewing audience, uh, on the next slide, I'm going to give a bit of a refresher on the um, on TIF. We talk about TIF. TIF is tax increment financing. Um, it's a property tax-based financial tool that comes from calculating the growth of property taxes within the defined geographic boundaries of a tax increment finance district. Um, we no longer use the term urban renewal, although that is legally the term that is used by the state of Oregon because um, we don't perform urban renewal. Urban renewal was something that was um, a practice in the 50s and 60s and often um, was um, the practice of sort of raising entire districts and uh, neighborhoods and creating major projects. We really engage in community development and economic development. And so we talk about the tool being tax increment finance and the districts in which we do that as TIF districts. Um, as a reminder, uh, TIF can be used uh, to invest in physical improvements in line with the priorities outlined in a district plan. Next slide, please. All right, so the 17 districts in operation today or that have recently been closed um, or are newly returning revenues to the taxing jurisdictions fall in three broad categories, as you see on this timeline here and in, in uh, related colors. So downtown waterfront TIF district, South Park Blocks, Airport Way, and Oregon Convention Center are all completed and have repaid their debt. So all of the resources are flowing back to the taxing jurisdictions. Few resources remain in these districts, if any, and if there are resources that do exist, they come from earned income. So uh, repayment of a loan or a uh, proceed from a property sale. The River District will pay off at the end of the fiscal year, as will all of the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative districts. Districts like the Central East Side and the River District, um, Lentz and three of the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative districts do have some remaining TIF, but it is fully programmed towards established priorities. So that leaves the North McAdam TIF District, Cully, Lentz, Interstate and Gateway I'm sorry, not Lentz, North McAdam, Coley, Interstate and Gateway with available resources that are not fully programmed. On the next slide, you'll see this visually represented. Um, and so it's, it's a little easier, I think, to see that what we're talking about is those districts um, in gray are basically closed and do not have remaining resources. Those in blue are at the end of the life of uh, the TIF districts and have very limited resources, and those in green have much more flexibility. Um, and as council is well aware, um, this is true for both Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau as 45% of new TIF uh, resources across the TIF districts are dedicated to affordable housing. In this case, uh, zero to 60% for multifamily or up to 80% for, uh, um, for uh, home ownership programs with the remainder that can be used for other commercial, community, residential, or infrastructure investments. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau hired Eco Northwest to perform the analysis that was requested. Um, and Eco Northwest, um, the, the methodology that they uh, used was to compare the um, remainder of the city that is outside of the TIF districts to the TIF districts. Um, and so it's, it's a comparison of the 10 TIF districts in particular that were active between 2000 and 2020. Um, it excludes the Neighborhood Prosperity Initiative districts, which although they are 
tax increment finance districts um, were so modest in scale that it felt like um, it would, would have been inappropriate to in include them. Um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so um, at a high level, we see that from 2000 to 2020, population, housing, and jobs grew faster in the 11% of the city that are in TIF districts than in the rest of the 89% of the city that is outside of a TIF district. You'll see particularly notable increase in population and housing units. This is perhaps not surprising given that uh, TIF districts are often aligned to, and in this case is generally aligned to, um, changes in zoning and land use designations or um, those districts that have, that tend towards higher intensity of residential uses. So large swaths of our city that are in single family um, housing zones are generally not within our TIF districts. Um, nevertheless, we have seen significant increases in population, housing, and jobs within the TIF districts over the last 20 years. Next slide, please. All right, so the first, uh, major takeaway that Eco Northwest found is that private investment within TIF districts outpaced public investments uh, and TIF, uh, TIF district investments or investments of tax increment finance uh, five to one. And the public-private expenditure ratio is at least two to one across all of the TIF districts. Um, but it really changes from TIF district to TIF district. So you see in places like Airport Way and Downtown Waterfront, the Oregon Convention Center and the South Park blocks that the ratio is closer to two to one. We get up to four to one when we're looking at Gateway, Lenstown Center and the River District. We are all the way to 10 to one at North McAdam and then it's a 16 to one ratio for interstate. So for every $1 of tax increment finance resources invested in interstate, there were $16 of private investments that were made. Across the uh, nine TIF districts that are shown here, um, they're doing some analysis on the central east side, so that will be forthcoming. Um, there was a total of 4.9 billion of private investment and about $1 billion of investment of TIF. So um, I think it'll be interesting to hear more about how Eco Northwest interprets this, but I think it is safe to say that TIF does not um, completely make the market. Right. It, it is not the case that if you put in X dollars of TIF, you will get Y outcome. Um, it is a complex environment. Uh, market demand is really significant. And so um, it is a participant and not um, the, it does not create the market dynamics in a given TIF district. Next slide, please. All right, the second takeaway is that housing production increased faster inside of tax increment finance districts than outside. In fact, 41% of all housing developed in the 11% of land in TIF districts. Um, again, this might not be surprising. Many TIF districts, uh, TIF district plans explicitly focus on housing investments um, as a priority. So for example, Gateway called for expanding and improving housing options. Interstate called for a increase of a broad range of housing types. Lentz called for providing new and rehabilitated housing units suitable for a um, households uh, at a range of incomes and housing needs. Um, and most districts have similar housing objectives. Um, so these housing, these council adopted housing goals combined with significant TIF in uh, investments and just the zoning and land use and market conditions has led to more housing, more rapid housing production within the TIF districts. Next slide, please. Um, so takeaway number three is that TIF supported 50% of all affordable housing units built since 2000. Nearly 6,000 Portland households were able to secure stable, affordable housing because of tax increment finance dollars in the last 20 years. Half of all affordable housing units built during this time period were built in TIF districts. And this momentum contributes to several of the policy objectives that have been articulated in the plans um, in order to create a full range of housing options. Um, one of the things as you dig down deeper that's interesting is that TIF dollars funded 56% of regulated units affordable to households earning 30 to 50% of area median income and 44% of units available um, affordable to 50 to 80%. So they funded a greater percentage of housing units at the 30 to 50% than at the 50 to 80% of area median income. 
Next slide, please. Um, so this slide shows that 56% of all affordable regulated units are inside of TIF districts. This heat map shows you where there's a high concentration of um, permanently affordable regulated units, and you see that that is largely within the central city and north and northeast Portland, um, but areas like Lentz and Gateway also have a, um, a, a, some, some degree of affordable housing within those districts. Next slide, please. All right, takeaway number five is that employment grew faster inside TIF districts than outside. Um, so jobs grew in aggregate uh, when you look and you combine all of the TIF districts um, faster inside TIF districts than the remainder of the city. And they grew faster in most individual TIF districts. So Airport Way and the Central East Side, Downtown Waterfront, Interstate River District, South Park Blocks, and Lent, Lent then in the remainder of the city. Um, in those areas that are in salmon colored, those were below um, the average for the city. I do want to note that this takes us through 2019. Um, so the employment information is not yet available for 2022 and 2023, and so um, Eco Northwest determined, given it's it's challenging, given that the most recent data really takes us in the middle of the pandemic, um, and so it stops at 2019. Um, and they're going to continue to evaluate more recent data as it becomes available. Next slide, please. And finally. Uh, the final takeaway, number six, is that um, Eco Northwest found that TIF districts are more racially diverse and are diversifying faster than the rest of the city. We know that residents in TIF districts are also younger than the rest of the city and that our K-12 population is more diverse than our older population. In a future phase of the consultant's work, they're going to follow up and really examine and dig into some of the um, indicators that might help us understand demographic changes to understand some of the drivers. But at a high level, we see that um, TIF districts um, have been and remain more racially diverse than the rest of the city. So with that, I'm handing it over to Lisa. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Lisa Abwaf. I'm the Director of Development and Investment with Prosper Portland, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm pleased to be here today to share an overview of our current TIF district-based work and related investments, particularly for the coming fiscal year. And this work certainly builds from the analysis and past investments that Director Branham shared, but it also applies the lessons learned um, that we have made over the past five, 10 years to better center community and equity in our investments, in our real estate projects, and in our public-private partnerships. Next slide, please. So as Shay shared from the economic development side, there's also significant alignment between our current TIF district investments and the advanced Portland strategy that we brought before you recently with particular focus on place-based priorities that are identified in the strategy from our TIF district action plan investments, which provide resources to further the recommendations that are tied to Old Town and certain areas of our central city through to investments along particular commercial districts like Foster in Lentz or Halsey Widler in Gateway or MLK in North Northeast, through to how we invest our loan and grant products that help to support small businesses and entrepreneurs, and also increase access to property ownership, construction, and vertical development opportunities that are key avenues to wealth creation. While I'll keep in mind that these longer term projects and investments really need to complement the more interim interventions that Shay discussed. So this section of the presentation is actually gonna do two things. Um, it's gonna focus first in providing a high level overview of what's happening across our TIF districts and some of the programs that we administer across those districts. And then I'm gonna dive really into detail on a TIF district by TIF district basis so you can understand how each of the budget line items um, line up to community priorities. Next slide, please. So investments across our TIF districts really um, happen via four major categories of work, work, and you see that in the pie chart with ballparking it, each of them, um, each of them having about a quarter of the investment over the five-year forecast. First, we have property investments that support future development, whether via land acquisition, holding, or partnerships, which you see in the property and acquisition investments category. Some of the larger investments that you're seeing show up in this five-year forecast include investments in the Williams and Russell project all the way through to potential future acquisitions anticipated for Gateway and in outer years in Cully. 
Second, we have investments via our property and business loan programs where we can complement the market and address community needs by providing lower return and more patient capital for commercial development projects. Examples include investments in projects like the North Northeast cultural business hub concept or property loans focused on supporting developers of color or investments in the Central East Side or Old Town in um, key properties where we can really incent anchor employment or middle income housing. Third, about a quarter of our investments are projected to occur as grants and infrastructure. We differentiate these because these are one-time investments that are not anticipated to create any sort of revolving fund back for reinvestment. And these are invest invested in our small business and nonprofit grant programs, which I'll, I'll provide a little bit of detail about on the next slide, through to larger infrastructure investments, like the site preparation at the USPS demo, um, through to large-scale street improvement investments, which we are anticipating for an area around the Gateway Transit Center, as well as in North McAdam to support development. And finally, as we buy and hold properties that are either what we would call operating assets, so they have tenants, they have revenue streams, et cetera, or developable properties, which are vacant land being held for work with the community to identify their future, we have property management obligations, and we currently manage about 45 properties across our portfolio from large scale properties like Union Station or the Inn at the Convention Center through to smaller remnant properties like the Holman Dock. And for our operating assets, particularly those with an income stream, our costs are actually offset by net operating income, which is, um, which is recovering following the pandemic after we provided a certain amount of lease uh, relief. Next slide, Tony. So as a reminder, many folks often think of us as a 100% funder when in fact we are not. The way that our TIF investments usually occur are most often through partnership efforts and agreements. And that's both at a large and a small scale. In this way, we're able to leverage private or community funding towards shared community outcomes and priorities. Whether it's our small business prosperity investment program grant where they uh, provide a 50% match or larger scale public-private partnerships like the projects that we did as phase one in Lentz Town Center at Southeast 92nd and Foster, include, including the Asian Health Services Center that you see here, where we invested only about a third of the overall financial stack that the center pulled together. Through partnerships, we're able to accomplish both uh, real estate and loan agreements that then translate into a direct investment of critical resor uh, TIF resources that do address key um, access to capital or financing gaps. We're able to leverage additional investment into the community, which is some of those outcomes that Kimberly shared, and we're able to deliver on key community priorities. Next slide. And we make these investments through a number of standing programs that we administer on a rolling basis or as, on an as-needed basis. Our small business grant program is called the Prosperity Investment Program. It provides a match to small businesses with a focus on BIPOC-owned businesses across our TIF districts, as well as anchor and heritage businesses like industrial firms in the Central East Side that we want to make sure that we preserve and grow. We also offer commercial property redevelopment loans that support both businesses and property owners when they go to build out, renovate, or develop via new construction. From projects like supporting Lady, Ladybug childcare that you see in one of the pictures here, who was looking for resources to move into a new space, through to providing full seismic renovation on projects like the Phoenix Pharmacy on Southeast Foster, where we worked with a longtime property owner to bring a historic building back to life. And finally, we also wanted to touch on um, activities that we have across our TIF districts that are called our affordable commercial tenanting pilots, where we can strategically position our assets and related tenanting opportunities to provide access to businesses via affordable commercial tenanting space at locations like 10th and Yam Hill, Lens Commons, and the Nick Fish in Gateway. And there, we're able to combine lease and tenant improvement support to small businesses businesses and we often actually connect them uh, to Shay's team as well to receive technical assistance through things like our inclusive business resource network. Next slide. We're also looking at ways as part of our financial sustainability plan to diversify our tools in response to community need. As TIF districts close out and based on past investments in those areas, we have identified a revolving pool of resources that are returning via loan payoffs, property dispositions and or net operating income off of our operating assets. And that revolving pool of funding 
is being allocated into a strategic investment fund that unlocks our ability to scale and have greater flexibility to invest in those needs that we, where we know there's high community priority. From increasing a pool for small business working capital loans to date that's been pretty limited to EDA funds that we have, through to developing new loan products like an acquisition loan or a mezzanine financing product, which will increase access to real estate and development financing and acquisition funding opportunities where we have heard a lot from community that those are priorities. Through to investing and actually acquiring operating assets like industrial properties in a way that complements the market and supports small business needs. For example, by investing in a shared kitchen space where we know there are gaps in the market and small business needs. So I am now gonna move on to kind of the second chapter of my portion of the presentation, and we're gonna go deep, so bear with me for a minute. So we will go um, action plan or, or TIF district by TIF district area. So the first area that we're gonna cover is the River District and Downtown Waterfront. We have um, combined these because in fact, half of Old Town sits in one TIF district and half of Old Town sits in, in the other. And our um, priorities across River District and Downtown Waterfront focus in three major investment areas. First, Broadway Corridor, completing the USPS facility demolition so you do see those sizable resources in our budget for the coming fiscal year. Partnering with the Office of Transportation and the Bureau of Environmental Services to start construction of streets and utilities and partnering with the uh, um, Parks and Recreation on an open space design for the eventual extension of the North Park Blocks and the Green Loop. We will also be transferring a par parcel to PHB for development as uh, affordable housing in a first phase. And finally, continuing our relationship with Related and Melvin Mark as we think about future private development on Broadway Corridor. The second big area of investment between the River District and the, the Downtown Waterfront TIF District budgets is implementing the Old Town Action Plan, where we are focused on stabilizing businesses through grants and loans. So you'll see the PIP line item, you'll see our commercial property redevelopment loan line item. We're also addressing some adjustments that the Community Association requested to really have uh, funding go to nonprofits as well as businesses on a rolling basis. Together with advancing middle income housing development on properties that we own within Old Town, knowing that there were major lessons learned coming off of the Central City uh, and Advanced Portland strategy findings, that areas with an improved and a better balanced mix of uses were more stable coming through the pandemic. And last but not least, we are also focused on disposing of what we call legacy properties within the agency of Centennial Mills and the old fire station. Next slide, Tony. Next, we're gonna focus on our two key uh, TIF districts in East Portland today. The first is Lentz, which you see on the left-hand side, and the second is Gateway that you see on the right-hand side. And as you see with Lentz, um, we have some minor remaining resources, and um, these are gonna address um, some remaining goals that we see as unfinished within the Lentz Action Plan. So while many of the goals have been accomplished, e.g. particularly the build out of the Lentz Town Center area, I think if everybody drives down Southeast 92nd and Foster today, you can see the difference. There are other goals within that action plan that we see as unfinished and we continue to lean into. And those are particularly the support for community development uh, investments and small business support along the key corridors of things like 82nd Avenue, 122nd Avenue, Powell, and other portions of Foster where we haven't made as sizable investments as we did in the Lentz Town Center. And we also, I would also highlight, we do have affordable commercial space at Lentz Commons, which is a property that Prosper does hold. In Gateway, we're looking forward to new development at 102nd and Pacific, and you see that in a sizable allocation for grants and infrastructure. This is a partnership with Mosaic as well as with David Douglas School District that will bring new middle income units to the Gateway Transit Center and pilot an innovative modular housing approach which will be fabricated in Portland. And our resources will go to investing in improvements that are called for in PBOT's Gateway Master Street Plan, which will then support development on private property, as well as future expansion by David Douglas School District on their Elks Club property. 
Other activities we have underway in Gateway are also an update of the five-year action plan. It's been about five years, so similar to what we did in Lentz, we're kind of reevaluating, and particularly now that there are more resources in the TIF district, identifying where community um, priorities and needs may have changed. And we are actively working on tenanting of the Nick Fish. We do own the ground floor commercial space of the Nick Fish out by the Discovery Park, where we anticipate building out the majority of the ground floor space for a BIPOC-owned childcare business, who, and we're really excited about its interface with the adjacent park. Next slide, Tony. Next, we're gonna talk about um, our implementation of the North Northeast Community Development Initiative Action Plan. This is in fact inside of the Interstate TIF District and our current focus um, via this action plan and working really closely with our leadership committee um, that meets monthly there is we are developing and launching new real estate based access to capital loan programs and piloting these in the North Northeast area, working with the TIF that we have available via Interstate. We're also working closely with MISO, Craft3, and Beneficial State Met Bank, amongst others, to really make sure that the financial tools that we're bringing to bear complement those that they have available for community. We're identifying opportunities to invest resources in affordable commercial um, and, and the siting of a cultural business hub, which was one of the actions called for in that action plan. And last but not least, we are supporting the Williams and Russell project in partnership with the Williams and Russell CDC and the Portland Housing Bureau. Our early investment that you'll see in the budget for next year will go towards land development activities like parcelization that will then support um, the eventual development of three distinct projects on that site, one of which would be affordable housing, another of townhomes and, and an office or commercial building. Next slide. The next two TIF districts that you see on this slide, on the left-hand side, you see the pie chart for our investments in the central east side. On the right-hand side, you see our proposed investments for North McAdam. Our investments in the central east side are focused on loans to support small businesses and property redevelopment together with our grant products. We've seen significant uptake in this district for those, just given its industrial and commercial character. This includes on properties we own, like the workshop blocks, but also via public-private partnerships. Together with an infrastructure allocation that we have put in place to support OMSI's master plan, particularly the build out of New Water Avenue, which we know will be key for new development envisioned in their master plan. In South Waterfront, we have long heard from community partners in South Waterfront about their infrastructure priorities, which include the continued build out of Southwest Bond Avenue to support OHSU's ongoing growth at the Schnitzer campus, as well as in the central district area. The development of the South Portal connection, which is at the south end of the district, and then the build out of the Greenway to really give folks kind of the opportunity to engage with the river along a continuum. And you'll see that in some of the resources we have this year into next with Alamo Manhattan as they build out the Greenway down in South Waterfront. We also continue to carry budget for, we do have a disposition and development agreement with Portland State University that resulted from an amendment to North McAdam a few years ago. And we anticipate this agreement could need amendment just based on PSU's current plans. Next slide. Within the newly formed Cully TIF district, we anticipate that year one budget, so the budget that you will be approving for this particular first fiscal year will largely be focused on community engagement costs to co-create an initial five year action plan as well as the, um, which was committed to in the TIF plan, as well as the governance charter. With near-term investments occurring via stabilization grants, like our Prosperity Investment Program grant to help small businesses stay and grow within the district in the next two to three years, and then longer term, we do have resources available that could go towards longer-term investments like land acquisition. <laughs> next slide. And fine, finally, but not last, um, we're also engaged in very various areas of the city where there is community interest in exploring future TIF districts. From East Portland and areas east of 205 or west of 205 all the way north to along the Columbia Corridor, we are working with partners both in community and within the public sector in terms of PBA and Metro working along 82nd Avenue to really identify next steps, convene the community and work that, uh, work that exploration analysis. Through to the downtown core and at key sites for high density development, we're also hearing interest in the potential for tax increment financing to support conversions, infill housing, affordable housing, and funding for infrastructure at key master plan sites that were identified in the central city plan where infrastructure resources are limited and infrastructure build out is critical to supporting high density future development. 
And I'm just gonna close with, I want, we also need to acknowledge as we hear this community interest, we know that any new TIF district investments would need to complement some of our near-term tools, both for recovery and retention, but also that there may be broader needs that complement it, like workforce training or capacity building within community. And with that, I think we are taking questions. Good, I, I've got one regarding the question of, of housing and tax increment financing. It looks like most of the housing that's currently being built by the Housing Bureau is low-income housing. Could workforce housing be built with tech dollars? Is there any prohibition against that? If we wanted to fill some of the missing middle, could we do it with TIF dollars? Mayor, we, we can and we uh, we have in certain cases. And Very so um, Lisa can speak to that. But I think what you um, will see within um, Old Town Chinatown, for example, is a prioritization of that middle income housing. Um, so above affordable, you know, above the zero to 60. But um, in Lentz, I think in the Lentz partnership, we went up to 120%. Um, and so there's, there's nothing statutorily within the use of TIF that prohibits that use. Um, the way that it's set up because of the set aside policy is that anything that goes to zero to 60% of um, AMI goes through the Portland Housing Bureau, so Prosper Portland doesn't have purview or say over that portion. Um, and then any of the other uses within that 55% can be um, you know, physical improvements in line with the priorities articulated in the TIF districts. Thanks, I appreciate it. Commissioner yeah. Maps. Sure, um, I wanna thank you for uh, the presentation today. Uh, and I might have missed it, and if I did, um, Maybe you can just help me understand. I think we began the presentation saying there was an $18 million gap. Did your presentation explain how that gap was gonna get filled or addressed? Or could you re-articulate to me how that's gonna get sorted out? Yeah, great question, Commissioner. So um, I, can, I think I touched on it really briefly. So um, what we are anticipating is that the $18 million will be filled through earned revenue and earned income. Um, and so Lisa mentioned and talked a little bit about the strategic investment fund that is um, seeded by program income, so previous earned income, and we're hoping that it continues to be a revolving loan fund, um, benefiting community priorities, but also creating revenue that we can use to offset some of our operating costs. Um, and so we know we can do it because 45% of our budget is currently from program income. Um, I think the key question that I have and that is an open question is just what's happening in the market and whether um, there are resource, you know, places where we can place capital. Um, but I think we're cautiously optimistic that it is possible. Uh, thank you, although I'm, I'm not sure uh, I'm tracking. Are, you, are we talking about loans here? Are we talking about... Yes. Being yep. a landlord, so yep. loans. Do you want to do you want to pull that slide up again and just walk through that? And Lisa, maybe Limited, you can speak yeah. to it. So I would think about it. The earned revenue comes from three major areas. One is loans, so both business loans and commercial property loans. I think the one with the strategic. The sure. second is from net operating income, so we do have properties that generate net operating income. Yeah. And the third is from land sales. So very often we'll buy property and then when we resell the property, if there is any incremental value, now sometimes there's not, sometimes there is, but that delta in value actually could come back in as earned income that goes into the strategic investment fund. And we have, as part of our financial sustainability plan, the last thing, just because Kimberly touched on this, I think we are trying to be intentional about not just thinking about operating income, but actually capital income sure. that we can reposition so that we have resources that can go back out into community. And if you look at it, it becomes a way that TIF districts, as they close out, can actually uh, contribute to a capital fund that's available for placement throughout the city. So we can then have our commercial property loans throughout the city. We can have an increased kind of access for working capital loans that we really haven't had a volume of resources to place in the past. Great, thank you. Does uh, Prosper have a reserve fund? I should know. Yeah, so it's an interesting question, Tony. We, we basically have contingencies in each of our funds. Yes, we have uh, contingencies that varies in each tax increment district. We also have uh, what's called a um, business management fund that holds about a six to seven million dollar reserve. We use that to cash flow, uh, lots of activities, for example, um, American Rescue Plan programs as well as community development programs where the cash is not there up front. So it's both a cash flow tool and a reserve tool. So those, re but those reserves are, t are um 
project specific, so you couldn't move extra dollars from one pot to another, from one project to another, or do you, can they move that way? Yeah, it, go ahead. Well, with the, Commissioner, with the new um, uh, strategic investment fund, uh, that will be citywide, and that has an allocation of up to $45 million over the next uh, five years. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one last question on this. So what happens, God forbid, um, if you're unable to reach the eight, to fill the 18 million, what it, is that, yeah, yeah, what does that scenario look like? So I think we would, um, you know, it would depend how much below we were, of course, but the main drivers, um, so I'll, I'll take a step back. So the financial sustainability plan is largely focused on our operating income or our operating investments and making sure that we have resources to um, support the staff that yeah. deploy the resources well, as well as some of our key programs. Um, there's also a uh, capital component to it and of course there's a relationship between the two. Um, but if we go below the $35 million that we need to support staff and key programs, I think we would need to look at whether we were making reductions in staff um, or reducing programs um, and to what degree. Um, and you know, we, we will have um, at least a year or two of advanced warning and so that would be a conversation that we would need to have with community, with our board and with you all in order to make those difficult decisions about what would need to be reduced. Okay, uh, thank you, that's helpful. And um, I'll wrap up with really what I will condense down to two comments um, so I can let my colleagues get in here. Um, I very much appreciate Eco Northwest um, attempts to um, evaluate the impact of, of TIF. I've been uh, eager to see that and I wanna thank Commissioner Rubio for circling back and making sure that work gets done. Um, I do have, at, no, I do have uh, some feedback. I'm not quite sure if I'm convinced that your control here is correct. So we have the sort of a, the treatment, which is basically imposing a TIF district on a neighborhood, and then our control group is kind of the rest of the city, which doesn't have a um, doesn't have a TIF district. Maybe that's right, but I don't quite know if I think that that that's right, especially when I look at the patterns, and I think that a lot of the patterns I see in your results kind of suggest neighborhood-based effects or demographic effects that kind of make sense um, given what's ha happening on the ground. So, I'm, so I'm, I'm not quite sure if that if that particular thing is getting at, you know, maybe trying to match neighborhoods, and I know it's very difficult, and I think I've even had talks with some folks over there around that, but I'll, I'll share that, and I hope that Someone at Eco Northwest watches this part of the interview of uh, this conversation and maybe thinks about strategies or can help me think about why this is the best we can do. Do you want to jump in here? Well, I'll just note this is, um, I'm sort of smiling because this has been a very active conversation that we've had as well. It's really challenging to, what, because the preponderance of the central city has been in a TIF district. And so, um, you know, I think what they, what they have been doing and what they're thinking about is trying to identify the counterfactuals yeah. and that is going to be more of a comparison so I think they would be the first to recognize that it is a very imperfect comparator um, and so definitely we'll share that with them they probably are watching um, but we'll share that with them and make sure that they when they get into the counterfactuals of what might have what might have happened but not for TIF, um, that they can speak to some of those questions great and, uh, um, I appreciate that uh, and one last thing. Um, I've been excited for um, the empirical evaluation of the TIF districts, partly because as a policymaker, here's the, here's the information or the, the test that I'm trying to um, evaluate. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out my return on an investment from a dollar I have in the general fund versus my return on investment for a, a dollar I have in TIF funds that are dedicated to economic development versus the return on investment for a dollar in TIF funds that I have um, set aside for housing. Um, and, and I'll tell you, especially because my thinking here has evolved a little bit, I'm even just on the housing piece, I'm kind of even comparing that to um, the return on investment um, for a dollar I have in, let's say, a housing bond and whatnot. 
I think you guys maybe get me closer here. I, I, although I'm not quite sure based on what I saw today, and, and I would need to read it more closely and process some um, if I have enough information to really weigh these different, weigh the returns on investments or the expected returns on investments I'm trying to get from the, this various mix of places we can put uh, the public's dollars. You know, obviously my goal here is to try to. Uh, we're going to do all of this to some degree, but how do I optimize the right mix is what I'm trying to figure out. Um, so as you tweak, uh, as we, as Eco Northwest tweaks their, those, their analyses, um, those are some of the things I'm looking for. And unless you want to jump in on that, I'll turn the floor back over to my colleagues. All right, thanks. Commissioner Gonzalez. I think the following question is very on what Commissioner Maps is getting at. and bootstrapping off of this morning's conversation and after going through each of these TIF districts, you know, is, is our primary assessment of what is a successful TIF district, the appreciation and property value that occurs, uh, the increase in tax base following that, or what are your primary metrics for assessing the success or failure of a TIF district? Mm -hmm. Follow-on questions of the TIF districts we just went through here What's the most successful? What's the least successful uh, from Prosper Portland's vantage point? And I don't mean to say that in a loaded way. I yeah. just sort of, kind of you know, the, the, the chance to check in, like, you sure. know, how would, how would we assess the, across the yeah. portfolio? Um, well, I, a few thoughts, and then I'm curious to hear my colleagues' perspectives and Chair Cruz's perspectives. Um, so. I think that each TIF district, while, while, the, while TIF is one tool, it is a, it is a, and it has some constraints in terms of the way that it can be used, it's a fairly flexible tool. Um, and so the intentions when the community and city council creates a new TIF district um, really are, I think, probably the measures of success. So when uh, a, you know, the Pearl District was really focused on making sure that the new neighborhood um, had infrastructure and was more dense than what was originally anticipated without TIF. And so the public-private partnership enabled um, the private sector to focus on the vertical development and the public sector de-risked it a bit by making sure that there was infrastructure and it was more accessible to the community because of the affordable housing that tax increment finance supported. Um, Airport Way, by contrast, um, you know, was in concert with the extension of the MAX line out there and built, built out, helped to build out Cascade Station, very different function than River District. So um, certainly, you know, the, the indicators that Eco Northwest has analyzed in terms of job creation and housing production are important to us across all of the TIF districts. Um, but I think there are places like the Gateway Tax Increment Finance District where the community would tell you and Prosper Portland would say that we probably have underperformed in comparison to what the community hoped for in terms of level of private interest um, and what we've been able to do with those resources. So. Um, I'd like to think a little bit more before completely answering your question, but I think at a high level, it's really, you know, what does the TIF district call for and then how have we performed um, with the understanding that markets and uh, community priorities change over time. Mm -hmm. um, so within the Interstate Tax Increment Finance District, that was really created in order to deliver on the Albina Community Plan. Um, and then decisions were made in terms of the sequencing of investment for the match for the yellow line. Right, and so, um, and it also came on the heels of, um, Tony's gonna have to fix it, address it, but there was some changes um, to the property tax um, and the way that TIF worked, and so there were fewer resources at the beginning to focus on affordable housing. Um, and, and over time, I think the focus from both the Housing Bureau and Prosper Portland has really been to get back to what the original intent of the district was, which was to stabilize the African American and long-term community members um, who had been co-creators of the Albina Plan. So um, hopefully that helps, um, but that's, let, let's, we can come back to you with some uh, additional thoughts there. I, I think that would be helpful. And, and to, also to sort of bootstrap off what Commissioner Mouse was getting at, when we're looking as a city at the various investment options we have mm -hmm. and comparing TIF to other choices we might make to stimulate growth, mm -hmm. to pursue policy, it's a challenge to compare it mm -hmm. apples to apples. Mm -hmm. And um, 
but whatever help you can give us <laughs> there as we sort of weigh these alternative, you know, considerations. I mean, we have infrastructure gaps in the city, and we have so part of our funding models for a lot of core city services is essentially broken in the next decade. That's a reality we're facing. At the same time, I will be a very strong advocate for considering, as we mentioned earlier, uh, urban renewal for you know downtown to ex extend the um, E district for to stimulate uh, a part of the city that's now in crisis uh, financially and uh, with very <laughs> dim short term and medium term prospects on some metrics and so, um, but trying to compare what le levers we pull is it's just so whatever you can do to sort of help us to compare the investments one one last point that relevant to both downtown and to uh the mayor's question so we have affordable housing we have workforce housing and then we have market rate housing and um do we judge the um the success of a TIF based on the increase in overall units created, or is I mean I thought it was in the aggregate um, data you showed on on TIF districts, but um, I'm just sort of curious if that's even a metric right now. And again, I'm thinking downtown when we're talking about converting office buildings to apartments, yep. and it's going to cost us $100 a square foot, yep. even with the seismic upgrade changes that we just made, um, and it's just trying to get a handle on. You know, if we created a lot of market housing through that, uh, through a TIF here, would that, would we deem that success? You know, if it's it is is uh, 20 years from now. Sure. Um, so you know, going back to the TIF district plans, most of the TIF district plans call for a broad um, diversity of housing types and for uh, different income. Uh, at, at you know available for different incomes um, and so I think what we see over the life and some TIF plans actually have specific um, affordable housing targets um, and so so each TIF district is slightly different um, but I think what we um, and you heard Lisa talk about this a little bit what we generally look at is where is the market not performing and so where might we step in and help to address that market failure? If there's a particular portion that is not performing um, at, you know, either if it's zero to 60 or 60 to 120 um, or just market rate above that, is there an area that we are not seeing, um, you know, product be able to come online? And why is that? And is there something that we might be able to do that would create that inclusive, vibrant diversity of incomes that we know make, um, neighborhoods more successful. So um, I think it's, you know, if we only built high income housing, I don't think anybody would feel that that was successful. Um, but also we know that the concentration of deeply affordable housing can have externalities as well. So I think we're, we are looking to see how we can complement what the market is doing on its own. Got it. Um, and Two last caveats and I'm done. Um, when I talk about the challenges of downtown, I, I also, the flip side's true. I think if we can articulate a positive vision for the city, for downtown, if we can communicate that the city's investing intelligently and optimism in it, I think that does attract capital. I think that helps us both retain and attract employers. So while I think our issues are serious, I don't, I don't mean to discount the importance of communicating that just the, the city's commitment to investment is a positive signal that um, I think the market may adjust to. Also to that last point on the different types of housing, my focus today, and same with the Housing Bureau on market rent housing is only the perception that we're having challenges there as, as a marketplace and generating enough supply and that that's having some really negative effects on market rates and it's, it's uh, that even with investment in low income, we may ha be having some unintended consequences if we can't create enough market rate. So I'd leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I just I wanted to add one thing, just because I think it's important, and it 
It's a really complex question and it has a really complex answer of kind of what you're asking about of what are the trade-offs of kind of tax increment relative to general fund. And I also just want to acknowledge in most TIF districts, we've actually combined those together. So we routinely will co-invest with the Office of Transportation. We actually act as the SDC match for a major transportation improvement. We leverage and are able to invest directly in the vertical development going up that's actually generating their SDCs that they're using as a match. Same in Gateway, we, the park is actually out in Gateway, is built on Prosper property. We bought the property we, with TIF, we handed it over to the Parks Bureau. We then contributed a certain amount of funding for the park to get built. And it's really about bringing the financial stack together. And I don't wanna, it is a really complex pro, uh, question that you're asking, but I also don't know that you can s completely separate and say, if I placed this amount of infrastructure instead of in TIF, you would, you would have gotten X versus Y, because in fact, as a city, we have married up those investments as best we can to get kind of a bigger bang for your buck. Understood, understood, thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Commissioner Ryan. <clears throat> Thanks. Kimberly, good to see you, Chair Cruz. Um, great presentation as always. This is kind of building off, I think, this conversation, but I'm trying to adjust what I'm gonna say so I don't repeat. Uh, you know, when you have the slide about the private over public, the five to one ratio, it, and you spent some time looking at why interstate was 16 to one and airport way was two to one. And, but I don't know if I heard like what the factors were on why there was such big gaps. I'm assuming some things, but can you just give me a couple good examples of factors that might play into that? Commissioner, I think this is one area where it will be good to have Eco Northwest be able to speak to that. I think we have hypotheses, but this data is something that um, they really just produced for us. This, I mean, this is this is hot off the press. So I think they're looking at it as well. Um, you know, what comes to my mind is just the degree of um, you know, interstate is a large di district. It's you know, so so it has a bigger in catchment area for investment. Um, but I also think it's an inner. Uh, city, or, you know, it's it's close in, um, and there has been a lot of development that's occurred in so much housing and right? so much Along housing multifamily right. that's that's occurred over the last um, 20 years. So it's a really good question, and we will take it back to Eco Northwest so that they can tease that out a little bit. Thank you. Um, and then, in the budget side of this whole conversation, with the ARPA dollars going away eventually, it's another cliff. It feels like another cliff. And what I noticed is that you've focused and you know we've had a lot of conversations about support for small businesses and that's most of our dialogue we've had and it, mm -hmm. it goes for the stabilization and the preventative right correct mm -hmm. so my my point is when those we're going to need those in two years from now and we won't have the ARPA dollars so is that a conversation the board and the staff is having about how to continue that much needed and wanted um, support for our small businesses. That's the number one uh, conversation I have when I'm just out in the community. You know, Commissioner, I think we had hoped, and we've all had this conversation, that the first $500,000 or $300,000 that City Can Council invested to support businesses that were having their windows broken um, would be the last time that that was needed, um, and that's just continued over time. And so the ARPA resources are very welcome because it's a significant amount, um, and it allows us to maintain that, that investment. Um, so we have not, in all honesty, done a lot of thinking about it. I think we are um, maybe slowly digesting the fact that this is going to need to um, be a ongoing program. Um, and probably what we would be talking to our board about would be just um, using the Prosperity Investment Program, which is our grant program, um, and making it an easier tool. Right now, um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a TIF based tool. Um, and so that might be what we would build on. Um, but I'm, we're gonna need to get back to you on that in terms of what might be some reasonable <coughs> ongoing resources for that purpose. And again, back to the complex, um, the complexity of this. Clearly our, our priorities around community safety, around homelessness, around who knew that the fentanyl crisis would get to this level. Um, all of these are the factors, right? And so that's what's happened since uh, 2020 is an yep. escalation of of all of these activities. So sure it was COVID and then we had the unrest and we thought this would go away. But all we're seeing from my friends out there is um, insurance rates going up, mm -hmm. incidents going up, fatigue going up. And uh, you, you've been like the aspirin for their headaches. And so 
I, I want, that's a compliment because they have said to me that if it wasn't for Prosper, they don't know what they would do. So um, I just think it's one of those big picture items that this entire council has to keep wrestling with, with you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. Um, great presentation, everyone. Um, I just have just a couple of questions. Um, first, can you explain to me a little bit more, say a little more about the third party uh, or property acquisition and the mezzanine financing, just so I understand it? Um, and then can, is this so, a tool solely within TIF or can it be used outside of TIF? Okay, the second question is easy. It is outside of TIF because, in fact, one of the limitations of TIF is we can't support a third party to buy okay. property. So we can buy property. The Housing Bureau can buy property. We can then put it out for bid or, um, or a partnership, but we can't provide kind of resources directly to a third party to buy. And we know there is very significant demand in community as well as folks looking to kind of get into or scale up in development. So it would allow us to have a property acquisition loan program that we don't have today because we've been constrained by TIF. Um, mezzanine financing is um, really, it's kind of, uh, um, it's uh, almost like our gap tool, but it is it complements conventional debt. So it comes in as more a higher risk, but it covers what uh, equity investor could look like is mezzanine financing and or it can be a bridge loan. So it gets you through construction okay. then it gets taken out. Okay. Thank you. And very okay. often that's your highest interest rate lending that comes into a project so you can bring a project's cost down by providing that product. Okay, great. Um, and then my last question is really um, talking about as we're, as we're looking east and creating more TIF districts east, um, can you talk a little bit about how that work is going to be informed by what we've learned from Kali? You guys want to take that one? You want me? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Fantastic question, and um, I really appreciate my colleagues Lisa's team's partnership on this as our, our teams have been collaborating on this for some years now. Um, the, Culley t the Culley TIF district, I think, community members were especially excited by kind of the, um, the, the list of allowable uses of projects, right? I think uh, Executive Director Branham just spoke to kind of lessons learned from interstate of what happened when you had the early investment in the yellow line without stabilizing community first. And so really when you're looking at the community-led aspects of the Cully TIF district, uh, folks were particularly excited by the fact that you are centering those stabilizing investments on the initial side of the work as you have those first years of increment. I think our partners in East Portland are similarly looking at that model, both from a governance perspective and the allowable uses, to say this is a, this is a tool that we could use as well. And there are some catalytic projects that you know, folks are looking at. I think the departure of Walmart um, along 82nd is, is something that folks are particularly excited by as the potential for community on that uh, community, whether it's stabilization or the resources on that site. So I think there are a number of lessons learned, both from Cully, but also I think from our previous work in other TIF districts. Okay, great. It's great to hear. Thank you. Commissioner Maps. Uh, yes. Um, Commissioner Gonzalez's comments, uh, I think, helped me refine some of my thinking about what I was looking for from Eco Northwest. So this is, I'm just putting this on the record for Eco Northwest to think about as they complete their evaluation. I think the real information or some information that would be very valuable and I think it would be relatively straightforward to pull together for this is just um, some data on change in property values in TIF districts versus outside of TIF, TIF districts. Um, I think from there you could use some algebra and figure out a bunch of different things and I think it's pretty straightforward to probably find that information. Um, and I think some of the issues we were talking about before about what our control group also sort of become less salient. So I'll just share that and I hope that um, in future iterations we can see some uh, analyses along those lines. Uh, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Do we have public testimony on this item? Uh, we do. We have one person signed up. Uh, Jonathan Isaacs was going to join us in person. I think I see him over there. Welcome, John. Well, what does that say? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, my, my mom is the only one that calls me Jonathan anymore, so I was... <laughs> um, Mayor Wheeler, uh, Prosper Commissioner Rubio, and, and commissioners, uh, thank you. My name is John Isaacs, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for the Portland Business Alliance, resident of Southeast Portland. I prefer he, him pronouns. 
the Alliance is Greater Portland's Chamber of Commerce and represents the largest, most diverse network of businesses in the region. More than 80% of our members are small businesses. I'm here today to express our strong support for the Prosper Portland budget and to urge the council to act urgently to put the Advanced Portland Economic Development Plan into action. First, I want to commend Prosper Portland Commissioner Rubio, Director Branham, and the Prosper Portland leadership team for the truly outstanding work they led, collaborating with a wide diversity of partners in the development of the Advanced Portland Plan. <coughs> It is a plan that meets this critical moment for our city with proposals big and small that are community and data informed, built on our strengths, and are consistent with our city's values. To urgently begin the implementation of Advanced Portland, we urge you to adopt the proposed 2023-24 Prosper Portland budget. Now I'd like to point out a couple of findings and recommendations in Advanced Portland that could be overlooked but are critically important at this particular moment. This plan, while optimistic and bold, is also realistic that we can no longer count on unfettered population growth. Multnomah County is shrinking, having lost approximately 25,000 people in 2021 and 22. This is permanently lost tax revenue. If we don't start thinking in a competitive mindset, we could watch an inexorable cycle of population loss and a shrinking tax base take hold. The Advanced Portland Plan calls out one of the reasons for our declining population. On page four, it plainly states that Portland's tax value proposition has eroded with increasing livability concerns and a 32% increase of taxes for businesses since 2019. Thankfully, on page 11, the Advanced Portland Plan offers a common sense policy prescription to this problem. It says, bring a resolution to city council to require inclusion of a financial impact analysis when new regulations, policies, or taxes will have an impact on private parties to understand the full cost to companies bearing the cost. Again, I want to thank Commissioner Rubio and Prosper Portland for advancing this common sense policy proposal and we urge the council to adopt this policy as soon as possible. I bring this up because we were dismayed that less than two weeks after the Advanced Portland plan was adopted, with these recommendations, every business and household was suddenly facing a proposed $38 million transportation tax, double the annual revenue of the voter approved gas tax. And as you know, several bureau bureaus are proposing fee and SDC increases of 5% or more. Again, I want to say thank you. Thank you to Commissioner Maps, who chose to have an open dialogue with a large group of Portland businesses of all sizes last week to hear how this new proposed tax would impact them. You heard how many of them have had to make tough prioritizations decisions as we all adjust to the post-pandemic economy, an exercise we suggest PBOT go through prior to asking for new revenue. And I should add another thank you to this entire council for, for opposing the proposed county capital gains tax measure, which is also far smaller than the proposed PBOT tax. And lastly, I wanna say thank you to the mayor who has pulled back several proposed fee increases in order to bring together a dialogue between multiple agencies and local leaders about the impact of rising taxes and fees. These actions demonstrate that you are listening to the community and willing to pause and ask hard questions about increasing costs to taxpayers and system users. I'm not here to argue that any given fee increase is, just, is justified or not, and no one wants a high-functioning city capable of delivering quality services more than the business community. But if we can't break the habit of just demanding Portlanders pay more and more, we now know a growing number will choose to move on to more affordable communities. For these reasons, we urge this council to adopt the Prosper Portland budget, and we urge you to align city bureaus behind the optimistic vision, priorities, and strategies that were well articulated in the advanced Portland plan. And one last time, thank you for your leadership. Thank you, John. Commissioner Maps. Sure, um, John, I wanna thank you for your testimony today. And in fairness to my colleagues, uh, um, the proposal to, uh, um, to find new ways to support PBOT is not something this council has taken up. Um, I, the commissioner in charge of PBOT, am responsible for trying to find a um, workable financial model for a bureau, which frankly today does not have a, a workable financial model. Um, I certainly have been out there for the past couple of weeks talking to Portlanders all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to find a consensus vision on how we can move forward with this bureau. Um, I really appreciate uh, um, the dialogue I've had with the business community, just as I appreciate the dialogue I've had with transportation advocates. Um, it's clear to me that we do not have a consensus vision yet. Um, this is my responsibility. I'm going to look for solutions moving forward. Uh, my colleagues have been very patient uh, um, and encouraging of me to try to find solutions here, but uh, that wasn't them, that was me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Very good. Colleagues, anything else before I move this along? Very good. This meeting of the Budget Committee is continued to May 18th at 2 p.m., where members of the committee will hear 
any proposed amendments to the budget and the committee will vote to approve the budget. All right, we're a few minutes ahead of schedule. The next item is not until 3.30 times certain, so enjoy the eight minute recess while you've got it. We're in recess. Why are you looking at me like you're shocked? Is there something wrong? No, good. We are in recess till 3.30. Recording stopped.
Recording in progress. All right, we're back in session. Time certain, please. Items 373, 374, and 375. Let's please read them all together. Item 373, amend city employee benefits program to reflect necessary plan design changes as recommended by the Labor Management Benefits Committee and administratively required by the Bureau of Human Resources for plan offerings from July 1st, 2023 through June 30, 2024. Item 374, authorize the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a three-year contract with Express Scripts Incorporated to provide pharmacy benefits manager services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources Benefits Office beginning July 1st, 2023, not to exceed $50 million. Item 375, authorize the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a five-year contract with Navia Benefit Solutions Incorporated to provide flexible spending account administrative services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources Benefits Office beginning July 1st, 2023, not to exceed $25 million. All right, great. Thank you, Keelan. Appreciate it. Every year, the city's Labor Management Benefits Committee reviews the Employee Benefits Program and provides recommendations for any necessary changes. The ordinances before us today comprise those recommended changes. Item 373 is the first ordinance, and it approves the fiscal year 23-24 benefit plan document addressing specific recommendations by the Labor Management Benefits Committee in addition to some, fate, some state and federally mandated changes. Item 374, of course, is the pharmacy benefits contract. The second ordinance would authorize the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a contract with our provider Express Scripts, Inc., to provide pharmacy benefit management services on behalf of the benefits office. And then last but not least, item 375 is the Flex Spending Administrative Services. The, uh, this would authorize the Chief Human, Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a contract with Navia Benefit Solutions Incorporated to provide our flexible spending account administrative services on behalf of the benefits office. I'll now pass this off to the Bureau of Human Resources Benefits Manager, Michelle Taylor, to provide greater context on these ordinances and their impacts. Thanks for being here and thanks for your patience. Absolutely, thank you all for having me and good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Michelle Taylor. I'm the benefit manager here with the Bureau of Human Resources in the benefit office. And I'm here to talk about three ordinances which are all being presented together, um, but I believe there will be a separate vote for each one of them. Um, before I get into the details, I really wanna use this as an opportunity to thank um, our value partners within the Labor Management Benefit Committee. They meet on a monthly basis to discuss plan design changes, review trends, um, and then really thoughtfully vote on recommendations that we bring forth to you, such as what we're doing today. Um, this group of seven labor folks represents DCTU, PCL, ProTech, Recreation, PFFA, PPCOA, PPA BOAC, and additionally, there's seven management represented folks on that committee from various bureaus such as PBOT, Water, Parks, Housing, BPS, and BHR. Together, this group works collaboratively to recommend meaningful and fiscally responsible changes for your approval to ensure our benefit plans can help recruit and retain the top talent which serves our community. I also wanna thank our valued partners within the Portland Police Association who have also collaborated on plan changes which respect the fiscal responsibility required to protect our health funds as well. They continue to make difficult decisions to ensure their impact to the Bureau budget is sustainable over time. I want to also extend a special thank you to our vendor partners for their continued support in providing innovative benefits which meet the needs of our employees and their dependents. Lastly, I wanna thank the entire benefit team and BHR. I am so proud to be a part of a team that works as advocates and supporters of city employees, retirees, and all their dependents. 
Um, so to jump in, the first ordinance, 373, authorizes changes to the health plan document for the new benefit plan year beginning July 1 of 2023. While the plan documents represent the legal requirements of the health plan and the health reimbursement account, by approving this ordinance, you are also approving plan design changes recommended by the Labor Management Benefit Committee and for administrative requirements which BHR and the Benefit Office are responsible to fulfill. We have two federal regulatory changes to um, include in this approval. One includes the end of the federal public health emergency which returns COVID-related claims to regular benefit coverage levels effective actually Friday, May 12th, um, 2023. COVID vaccines will remain covered at 100%. Um, there are some additional changes to the No Surprises Act of 2021 Consolidated Appropriations Act, which includes um, allowing for ongoing changes when final rules are enacted as they're continuing um, throughout the, the years. There are two um, state-based regulatory changes, which include changes to the definition of a disabled de adult dependent. Um, disabled adult dependents starting July 1 can be covered if they have a written statement from the child's physician and the child had at least two years of medical coverage on the parent's plan before reaching age 26 and one of the following. It's a long one, bear with me. Um, the subscriber claims the child as a tax dependent, the child's tax return shows an adjusted gross income of 150% or less of the federal poverty level, or the subscriber is the legal guardian of the child. It actually expands the definition of what we have currently in our plan. Um, the second state change is the removal of a trip limit for emergency ambulance services. There had previously been about a 300 mile radius but now it's going to be dependent upon the nearest facility capable of meeting the needs of the individual. So also an expansion, a little bit less restrictive than it, what, it, what it was before. Now I'm gonna move on to the changes that were actually recommended by the Labor Management Benefit Committee, which are up for your approval today. Um, changes to the City Core Medical, that's the self-funded PPO plan, include the removal of four visit maximum for nutritional therapy services. Um, so in the past, there was a cap of four. We're asking that to be removed to ensure that there's compliance with the Mental Health Parity Act. Um, prior authorization would not be required for the first five visits, but any additional visits would require a prior authorization just to ensure medical necessity. Um, changes to the Delta Dental Plan recommendations include reducing the waiting period for restorations following interim carries arresting medicament application from three months to two months. Now you're asking what that is, right? So um, in lieu of doing a filling, there is an application that a dentist can place on a tooth. And then in the current plan, it um, allows a dentist to reevaluate after three months. This is reducing it to two months because there is um, some evidence that you can determine whether or not that additional or that uh, more invasive type procedure um, fillings are needed after that period of time. I like to call it a tooth band-aid. Um, it's the, the step before the filling. Um, so more frequent uh, ability to apply that under the Delta Dental Plan. Changes to the Kaiser Vision Plan include increasing the vision hardware allowance from $150 to $250 every tw 24 months. That would bring it in line with our other vision plan and also adjust for the increased costs in vision over time since that hasn't been changed in an incredibly long period of time. Um, the last recommendation from the Labor Management Benefit Committee is to continue the expanded <coughs> visits allowed under our Employee Assistance Program. Um, right now they are, it, it's been a pilot program for a couple of years now, increasing for um, PFFA folks, those are our firefighters, from eight visits to 13. And then for the rest of the city folks, it is um, uh, from five to 10. So we're recommending that we keep the, the additional five employee assistance program uh, visits. Those are no cost, they're completely confidential to employees and their household members as well. And this is also for our casual and seasonal folks who generally aren't eligible for some of our other benefit plans. Um, based on the changes that we've described, federal, state, and LMBC recommended, the final health premium costs and self-funded rates 
are increasing approximately 2.3% for the fiscal year 23-24. The health operating fund budgets include appropriations in support of the health plan costs associated with this ordinance. As in prior years, we draw down the health operating fund reserves to lessen the cost impacts to bureaus and employees. This has really been an important strategy to balance against our high increases. The second ordinance, 374, authorizes the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a three-year contract agreement with Express Scripts Incorporated, providing pharmacy benefit manager services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources Benefit Office beginning July 1 of 2023. We are seeking a three-year contract with a not to exceed value of $50 million. Our current contract with Express Scripts is set to end June 30 of 2023. So we went out to a competitive bid request for proposal process utilizing the special procurement rules for benefit contracting. Uh, contracting with a pharmacy benefit manager ensures the city has a specialized group to manage prescription benefits on behalf of our self-funded medical plans. Express Scripts is, is responsible for negotiating prescription costs, for managing and developing formularies, and protecting the city's plan in a fiscally responsible way. The city's benefit office, labor management benefit committee, Portland Police Association, and our consulting group will continue to monitor the plans and make recommendations to council as appropriate. Pharmacy costs are projected to rise annually. So any admin fee reductions, increased discounts, rebates, anything of the like, help the city offset continued increases. Continued specialty program implementations and strategic contract negotiations with our provider will be key in helping the city curb pharmacy costs over time. Going out to bid regularly allows for the most competitive pricing, service guarantees, while keeping in mind minimal disruption to our members. With our continued partnership with Express Scripts, we are expected to save the city and plan participants over $2 million in our first year of the new contract compared to our current pricing and about $8 million over the contract period of three years, which amounts to over 20% in savings versus current. The third and final ordinance, number 375, authorizes the Chief Human Resources Officer to enter into a five-year contract with Navia, providing flexible spending account administrative services on behalf of the Bureau of Human Resources beginning July 1 of 2023. The not to exceed contract amount is 25 million and is mostly comprised of reimbursements to Navia for qualified claims reimbursement paid to plan participants and funded through voluntary employee contributions. It's over $24 million of employee contributions, but the contract has to be that high to ensure the money can flow through correctly. This is a new vendor as a result of a competitive bid process and results in the city saving almost 25% in our annual administrative fees, while increased functionality, including debit card access for those who use dependent care expenses, better claims adjudication process for an enhanced participant experience, and more accessible technology. This contract allows us to continue offering valued pre-tax healthcare and dependent care spending accounts as an employee benefit to help our workforce offset their out-of-pocket costs. The request for the, the funds for these um, three ordinances are available within the city and PPA health operating funds in addition to the payroll clearing funds for employee contributions to the flexible spending account. Um, before I conclude my remarks, I just want to put out a shameless plug that our open enrollment begins on Friday, the 12th. So if anybody has any updates to make, please log in between May 12th and May 31st to ensure that your uh, changes get captured for July 1. With that being said, this now concludes my remarks. I ask for your support in authorizing these three ordinances, and I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you. Any questions at this particular juncture? Good, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I believe we have somebody signed up to testify. We have one person signed up. Perfect. Kimberly Goheen Albon. Hi, Kimberly. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Got a little 
a little chair here. My name is Kimberly Goheen Elbin. I'm a life citizen of Clark County, Washington, USA. Um, this is my first time speaking here. So I want to introduce myself a little bit more. At the age of 18, I took an oath to protect America from foreign and domestic enemies. And um, at the Vancouver Barracks, and uh, any city council that has a membership in the United Nations entity called the ICLEI is um, a foreign, or excuse me, a domestic enemy in my opinion. Uh, this council is a member of that United Nations entity and I don't think I'm being recorded maybe on person I, purpose. I, I hope that the citizens can understand that that is my job to wake up uh, the citizens of America to the undermining uh, membership of the ICLEI. It follows uh, the United Nations. We don't want to be in the United Nations. And uh, so I'll, I'll get to the um, agenda here a little bit. First I, I ask uh, downstairs, the employees here would like to have their coffee back after the COVID pandemic. So maybe next week I can have a cup of coffee here instead of going across the street. Anyway, Portland has good coffee, huh? Um, I'd like to ask this council to show healing and stop using the word racism as a constant reminder of those that just hate others no matter what. Yeah, you know, I've grown up here. I, I ask my children, have I ever been racist? No. And, and I know that there's out there, but we're always going to have haters. We're not in heaven yet, are we? So, um, and the word equity also follows the United Nations ICLEI. That's a key word that you can find, uh, sustainability, equity. Maybe I'm educating you folks here too. Maybe you don't know that you're members of uh, a, a United Nations. Um, so let me go back here. I, I, you know, you're going to be passing these under an emergency. I just heard that the emergency over, we've been hearing that, it's been over for a while. Um, so I ask what emergency are you going to be passing these uh, 50 million hard-earned tax dollars? And that's just here in Portland, of course, I'm over there. Uh, Vancouver City Council are 15-year members of the United Nations, and uh, they're my duty over there. Um, it, you know, it, it says here in your community impacts and uh, community involvement, the action is largely internal to the city government process. Big city right there. People need to wake up. We want our government, love, love all you guys. Keep your jobs and all that, but you must do it under the lens of the Constitution. And so that when the people vote you in, we believe that you're under the Constitution, not the United Nations. This is a, a, by the way, I want to let the public know that the ICLEI has a two-fold agenda. It is to have a one-world order government, Thank and you. that is going on, and they want to depopulate the world, and that's happening also. Thank you. Thank you. Are my three minutes up, sir? Yeah, I'm afraid Thank so. You. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, colleagues, any further comments or questions before we call the roll? Okay, we'll start, Keelan, with item number 373, an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. And uh, we'll go to 374, an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. And last but not least, item 375, an emergency ordinance. Ryan. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. I would like to thank Michelle, and I'd like to thank our Labor Management Benefits Committee group for their hard work on this. I really appreciate the changes that they brought forth this time. I'm, I'm really glad that we have a group of uh, employees and managers working together to highlight some of the necessary changes to our benefits program. I think these changes significantly improve our plan offerings. These benefit plan changes expand critical health care access for our employees and it also puts equity and social determinants of health at the forefront of decision making. That's not only the right thing to do, it's also good business to do it that way. I'm encouraged by the expansion of service while maintaining low overall costs, and I wanna thank everybody who worked so hard on this. I vote aye, and the ordinance is adopted, and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody.